Good morning and welcome to today's interview. Today I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Ajay Abad, who is an assistant professor of oncology and neurology at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center and the principal investigator of the SURVIVE trial. Today he's here to tell us about some recently announced results of the trial, which is investigating the brain cancer vaccine, CERVAXM. Dr. Abad, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. To start off, I'd like to introduce yourself and share a little about what you do. Sure. So uh, I am a uh, neurologist and a neuro-oncologist. So I did my neurology residency and then neuro-oncology fellowship. Um, so as a neuro-oncologist, I take care of, uh, well, uh, patients with brain tumors, primary brain tumors, um, and then also uh, deal with patients who have neurologic complications of other cancers. So um, I've been at Roswell Park for almost 10 years now. Um and uh, a, a big chunk or a big focus of what I do in terms of the patients I see are patients with primary brain tumors and, um, you know, specifically glioblastoma, which is uh, the most common malignant primary brain tumor that we deal with. Great. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the treatment landscape for glioblastoma and why it's vital to develop new treatments? Uh, yeah. So glioblastoma, uh, again, it's a primary brain tumor. It's a malignant primary brain tumor, so it originates in the brain. Um, the, uh, standard of care treatment is maximal safe surgical resection. Uh, that's followed by concurrent chemo radiation. So you have radiation therapy that's targeted to the surgical bed and a margin around it. Um, and it's fractionated. So it's usually, uh, about 30 treatments that span a period of about six weeks. Um, and, uh, generally that's, um, uh, administered with chemotherapy in hand. So it's a, a low dose of an oral chemotherapy called temozolomide. Uh, it comes in pill form. And so patients, as they're going through radiation therapy, they take a low dose of the chemotherapy daily. Um, the thought is that it there's, there's a synergistic effect and that the chemotherapy sensitizes the tumor to the effects of radiation. Um, so after that six week course of chemo radiation, then there's usually about a one month break and they transition, uh, to adjuvant chemotherapy. It's the same chemotherapy. Um, the temozolomide is just dosed differently. Uh, it's dose dense or high dose chemotherapy. Um, generally patients will take the chemotherapy for the first five days in a month. Um, and the goal is to get, you know, at least six months or six cycles of chemotherapy in that way. Um, in addition to that, um, there is uh, a device. It's called uh, Optum or Tumor Treatment Field Therapy that patients can uh, wear. Uh, it delivers an electromagnetic field um, to the tumor bed. Uh, it's these arrays that patients place on their head, um, and it is powered by a battery pack that they carry around. Uh, and the goal is for patients to wear that about 18 hours a day. So it's, it's a commitment. Um, and so that usually is paired with the adjuvant, uh, chemotherapy. So that would start once they finish, um, the concurrent chemo radiation. So that constitutes sort of the, the standard of care as it is. If you look at our national guidelines for glioblastoma, um, you know, with that, uh, you know, the median, um, overall survival is not great. So for patients with glioblastoma, um, depending on the, you know, your reference source, but, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 to 18 months. Um, and that's with treatment and that's from the time of diagnosis. Um, and so certainly with those numbers in mind, there is a unmet need for these patients in terms of new treatments and new treatment options. Um, and it's, you know, as a neuro-oncologist, it is a bit frustrating, uh, you know, for, for our, for our patients with glioblastoma in that, you know, the standard of care has been the standard of care, you know, for, for several years now. And, you know, so certainly looking for new uh, treatment options on the horizon that can move the needle for them. Absolutely. Thanks for explaining and, uh, and sharing what the landscape currently is. So I'd like to tell us about CERVAX-M. Uh, what kind of treatment is this and how does it work? Yeah. So it's an immunotherapy. Um, and so specifically it's a peptide based vaccine. So, uh, it is, um, a vaccine that, uh, so basically, so glioblastoma cells, um, 
they uh, have both within the cell and on the surface a protein called survivin. Um, and so survivin normally is not found in, in the human body. Um, you know, it is something that I think is also expressed like during fetal development, but uh, it is found in glioblastoma cells, but otherwise, you know, not found in any other brain tissue. Um, and so it makes it an appealing uh, target for like the vaccine strategy. So, you know, basically, you know, with, with vaccines, what you're trying to do is, um, you know, mobilize your, your immune system to attack uh, things that are foreign. So in this case, um, with this peptide-based peptide vaccine, uh, patients are given a subcutaneous injection. It's like a flu shot, basically, um, of the surviving peptide uh, with a couple of other uh, compounds to kind of help to try to boost the immune response. Um, and in effect, you're exposing your your body, your immune system to, to this peptide that, again, is also found in tumor cells and glioblastoma cells. And so, uh, you know, the immune response, it's uh, multifaceted. So, you know, there's um, antibody or B cell response. There's a T cell or cytotoxic T cell response. And then you also have kind of a more general kind of um, production of cytokines. And this is all part of the inflammatory response. Again, the idea is that it's programmed specifically to target uh, glioblastoma cells. So, um, so the vaccine, there's two phases. So there's uh, what we call the priming phase, which is where patients will get, again, this injection, uh, basically like a flu shot, uh, in usually the shoulder. Um, during the priming phase, they get a series of four injections. Uh, each injection is two weeks apart. They kind of alternate between the right and the left shoulder each injection. Uh, and then after the priming phase, uh, they move on to the maintenance phase, which is, you know, an injection uh, at least as part as part of the randomized study that uh, uh, that was completed last year, it was an injection every two months. So it's almost like a booster or maintenance injection. And the uh, so the priming phase would start after chemo radiation. So again, after that six weeks of chemotherapy and radiation, you know, within a few weeks for patients, um, you know, who uh, were treated with the vaccine, they would start you know, kind of at that point. That's amazing. It's really fascinating to hear about this this new approach. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it's it's very exciting, and it's it's um, something that was uh, conceived and developed at Roswell, um, mm -hmm. you know, here in Buffalo. So uh, it's uh, certainly near and dear to a um, you know a lot of people, you know, at this institution. Absolutely, it's very exciting. So, what is being investigated in the Survive trial, and uh, what were the interim results that were announced recently? Yeah. So. Uh, in the SURVIVE trial, uh, so this was, you know, this was specifically for patients with newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Um, and so, uh, you know, in previous studies, what was found was that, you know, this vaccine seems to be most effective in patients with a low tumor burden and, you know, right after uh, their initial diagnosis. This seems to be when the immune response was um, uh, the strongest and when it made sense to kind of capitalize on that. Um, so basically patients who are newly diagnosed, um, you know, they did, uh, have to have a tumor that was, um, uh, accessible to resection, or, you, you know, you were basically able to remove, you know, most of the tumor that you could see. Um, and again, once they went through the concurrent chemo, uh, radiation phase, the six weeks of treatment, then they would be randomized. Um, so basically it was a randomized study. So what does that mean? So, um, you know, it was placebo controlled. So, uh, a certain proportion of the patients got the drug. I think it was two thirds of the patients got the drug. One third of the patients received the placebo. It was double blinded. Um, so that means, you know, they don't know, we don't know, uh, you know, who got what it was across several hospitals. I think we, we enrolled, you know, upwards of 200 plus patients. Um, and, uh, you know, the interim analysis, um, that was, uh, or the results of that, which were, um, you know, announced not too long ago, what we were looking for was, was there enough of a separation between the two curves, right? The two patient, um, cohorts, uh, that, you know, we weren't, we weren't required to enroll more patients or, you know, basically the study was powered well enough, uh, with the number of patients that we enrolled, um, that, uh, we are, you know, we basically, so, so the study did not need to be modified. We didn't need to uh, enroll any more patients. 
And that's usually a positive sign. You know, that means that at least, uh, you know, you're looking for a, a positive signal that it does, you know, add uh, some survival or benefit patients. So we're waiting for those curves to separate out. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, a, a big, um, it's a big milestone, you know, especially for late phase studies like this, um, you know, to get that, uh, you know, basically over that first hump. Uh, and, you know, hopefully the, you know, the results will bear out. And uh, this is something that, you know, we're really hopeful that our patients will be able to access across the board. It's really exciting to hear about these results and uh, look forward to hearing more about it as the trial progresses. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So as um, as the research continues, how do you foresee CERVEXM changing the landscape for glioblastoma in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, again, it's, it's you know, we're looking for treatment options for our patients that move the needle. Um, you know, if you look at the, you know, earlier phase, the phase 2A uh, results for, you know, about 50 patients who are enrolled um, for same same patient characteristics and newly diagnosed patients, they all got the drug. Um, you know, at least in that study, uh, you know, it um, almost doubled overall survival, you know, for, for that cohort of patients on average. So, um, you know, this is a tough cancer. Um, you know, we certainly aren't at the point where we're, you know, talking about strategies that are curative, right? I think what we're trying to do is, you know, extend our patients' um, life, but also their quality of life as well. I think one of the appealing aspects of Cervaxin is the, um, the, you know, the fairly low side effect burden. You know, um, a lot of our patients, apart from some soreness that you would normally get with a flu shot uh, or any other sort of, in, you know, vaccine, you know, that's those, you know, there weren't a lot of side effects associated with Cervaxin. I think that's really important for our patients. Um, you know, between chemotherapy and radiation, the burden of these treatments can be pretty heavy. Uh, the side effects can be pretty, pretty difficult to manage sometimes. Um, and certainly the cognitive side effects too, you know, as, uh, as these patients kind of proceed through treatment and often when the tumor progresses. So, you know, what we're looking for are treatment options that, again, add to um, length of life, but meaningful quality of life. And I think, you know, Cervaxin to, to some extent um, kind of checks all those boxes. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that, you know, um, for, for a lot of patients who are diagnosed with this terrible disease, um, at least offers them, you know, again, some hope of, you know, being around a little bit longer, hitting, you know, more milestones, you know, um, being around for more special events and things like that for their, you know, for their families. Um, you know, it's hard to have conversations with, you know, with patients when you're, you know, you're talking about uh, potentially, a, you know, a timeline where, you know, survival for these, can you know, for this cancer is, is less than two years. Um, you know, that's a hard first conversation to have. No, absolutely. That's, that's great that Cervaxim is able to offer some hope for this really challenging disease. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So last question I have for you today, um, since sure. we'll be posting this um, on July 16th, which is Glioblastoma Awareness Day, um, are there any messages you'd like to share with clinicians either about um, this research and how it's offering new hope or just about um, take home messages about glioblastoma in general? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... Uh, you know, even though the, the progress sometimes is, is slow, I think, um, you know, uh, research uh, and clinical trials, especially in glioblastoma, is really important. I think the, you know, the, the nice thing about neuro-oncology is that the neuro-oncology community is not that big. And so I think, you know, what I, what I love about neuro-oncology is that, you know, we um, communicate and talk to other neuro-oncologists and, you know, um, put our best foot forward to do the best by our patients. And if that means there's not a trial, you know, here, but there's a trial, you know, a few hours away to a different hospital. I think, you know, a lot of us are like-minded and, you know, very much advocate for our patients and reach out to other centers. I think part of the reason, you know, um, Cervaxim is, you know, we've gotten to this point is, is, is because of that. I think, you know, a lot of, um, you know, other neuro-oncologists, they don't hesitate you know, if this is a, a, a meaningful treat, you know, treatment option or possibility for their patients, you know, they, they reach out. Um, and, you know, because of that, we were, we were able to enroll patients, you know, relatively quickly for a, 
you know, uh, a trial this magnitude. So I think, um, you know, again, you know, it's research like this is, is possible only through collaboration. Um, and, um, I think that this trial kind of really highlights, you know, that, you know, within neuro oncology, especially, uh, because, you know, again, our, our patients are suffering, um, and, uh, you know, it just really motivates us, you know, to want to do the best for them, find the best treatment options for them and, you know, be humble enough to say, Hey, if it's not here, you know, let's, let's find, let's find out where. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why we are where we are today with Cervaxin. Definitely a great message to wrap up on. So thank you so much, Dr. Abad, for coming on today to tell us about this research and how it's helping to move the needle forward in glioblastoma. Uh, we really appreciate your time and looking forward to hearing more about the research as it progresses as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it.